everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Elaine, and on behalf of CSO and Lahanas, I would like to thank the panelists for participating in today's event, as well as the students for attending the program. My role for today's panel will be as a moderator, and I will ask questions created by Lahanas Leader, but Ms. Dorothy Commons will be periodically checking the chat, so please feel free to write questions in the Q&A function, and we will ensure those questions are answered. With that being said, I would like to introduce our panelists for today's event. Today, we have four panelists that will talk on their experiences and perspectives of the One Health hiring process. Our panelists include Helen Kim, who is an associate at Goodwin and a former recipient of the Goodwin's One L Diversity Fellowship Program. We have Mr. Ed Chang, who is a litigation partner at Sharon and Lodgins. We have Ms. Amanda Modehon, who is an assistant general, uh, attorney general at the M Massachusetts Attorney General Office. And we have Ms. Tracy West, who is the current director of diversity and inclusion at Wilmer Hill, former, former Boston College Law School Associate Dean for Yay. External Relations, Diversity and Inclusion, and the creator of Lahana's program here at BC. Um, so to start with the questions, Tracy, uh, circling back to you, Having participated in multiple DNI initiatives, both at BC and Wilmer Hale, but also having a legal career across different sectors, how would you define, define diversity and inclusion in that light? Can you also talk to why diversity and inclusion are important in the legal profession and the steps that your office in Wilmer Hale is taking to recruit diverse law students and or attorneys? Okay, compounded questions, here we go. Um, let's see. Uh, actually, I like to say inclusion and diversity. Um, and I actually would say this at BC when I was there my last few years, because as I would always tell the students, uh, and by the way, hello everyone, I miss you all. I'm sorry that this is one old group I haven't had a chance to meet yet, but I'm sure you all are well and in great hands. Um, if you guys are able to find an organization that is inclusive, generically and really inclusive, diversity is going to follow. I have observed organizations that focus on the diversity, which is the numbers, the what you are, right? So we can check our box and they're dysfunctional and they have challenges with retention and um, they're not actually able to truly appreciate why differences make a difference. That being said, uh, one of the primary reasons reasons that uh, really drove me more towards Wilmer. I had a couple of few different options of what I was going to do, but Wilmer stood out the most because they had already taken these large tasks um, uh, to heart and had started working towards be making sure that they were becoming and maintaining a more inclusive environment. They are at a place where they're open-minded, willing to learn, and um, value. I mean, this is, they have a long-standing value of DNI. Um, they have been, or had been, one of my largest firm sponsors throughout my tenure at BC Law School. And they also recognize the fact that it's not just about Wilmer Hale. So our initiatives are also attempting to impact the legal profession. Not everybody can come to Wilmer, but there are things that we can do to help others um, with, their, with their journey. And internally, in the sense of the way that they are certainly uh, reemphasizing over and over again, has to do with the resources that are available for historically underrepresented lawyers and various stakeholders at the firm. Um, this has been a very challenging year, obviously, between COVID and the Black Lives Matter movement and, you know, just, even with the upcoming election or the election that just passed, hopefully that was it. Um, it, it it's, there's been a lot on our plates and I was just very proud to be a part of an organization that really stepped up and we do more than just walk the walk. Um, internally, we have uh, initiated a, um, a, a civil rights initiative uh, where pro bono, this is across the firm, firm wide, our attorneys are interested in working on matters that are specifically related to racial justice, um, uh, police misconduct, uh, 
helping others from historically, again, underrepresented backgrounds with their business uh, career trajectories and goals, which is great because it also expands upon the internally, the different types of talent we have at the firm. So historically, oftentimes these mostly fall under the litigation department, but now we were able to include members from our corporate department or our tax, you know, because the, there were different types of opportunities presented that we needed their talent. Um, and we've also just started internally um, a fellowship um, which is the, and why did I just go blank with it? Because I was just talking about it a few minutes ago, um, the Peyton uh, Fellowship, which we have selected two of our associates who have identified um, uh, organizations that again, the Peyton Fellowship Program, that they have identified organizations that specifically focus on racial justice, um, policing practices, criminal justice reform and other related opportunities where for six months they are able to, um, I guess, serve in a secondment per se and work with these organizations while still being attorneys at Wilmer Hale. Um, the firm does value this very, very seriously. And if they didn't, I don't think this is where I would be. <laughs> Those of you who know me know that that's accurate. <laughs> Did I answer everything? Because that was a long question, Elaine. I'm trying to think <laughs> if I remember it. Okay. Um, no, that was the perfect answer. Thank you, Miss West. Um, now, Tracy, Ms. please. <laughs> uh, Miss Modehone, as Tracy mentioned, creating an inclusive workplace is important to attract, retain, and promote diverse talent. What does the AG's office do to foster an inclusive workplace? Thank you, and you can call me Amanda as, as well. Thank you, Elaine. Um, so our office, you know, I guess kind of as an initial matter, we're, you know, the AG calls our office the people's law firm, right? So we are, our goal is to serve the Commonwealth. And so we want a staff that is reflective of the people we're serving. Um, and so, and that's, you know, like Tracy said, that's, that's a good goal. But once you are, you know, working towards that goal, you also want to make sure that people feel that they belong and that they can not just survive, but thrive in, in your organization. So um, some things that we do, we have um, a diversity and inclusion committee, which is really active in the office. Um, we have two subcommittees. So we have a recruitment and retention subcommittee and then a community outreach and education. And so I think that's a nice kind of way to frame our um, diversity and inclusion committee because it has that focus on both how do we uh, recruit more talent? How do we keep the talent we have? And then what do we do to, you know, make sure that the rest of the office is also inclusive? Um, we have uh, regular trainings um, throughout the year. There's no, you know, there's no Massachusetts CLE, but our office has CLE requirements. And so there's CLEs and a lot of people end up, I've gone to a number of them and they're really high attended. And then we have specific um, trainings for management. So trainings focused on um, diversity and inclusion and how to make, you know, kind of manage your whole workforce in a way that is, is thoughtful um, and promotes diversity. Um, so those are the ways that we work within the office. Our part of our community um, outreach and education includes celebrating, you know, we have um, each, each month we have different, like the Black History Month, Latinx History Month, um, Southeast Asian. So we cover a lot of a lot of the the celebratory months and really do it in a way that's not just you know checking the box, but is is exciting and fun. Um, was more fun when we were in person. We would do um, for like you know Hispanic Heritage Month. We did uh, Zumba classes and, and like potlucks. I miss potlucks so much. So so you miss that part, and that really is something that especially like. I'm Latina, I'm Cuban, food is such a big part of our culture, so I miss that part of it, but we've done a lot to adjust to the current reality, and so we now have a racial justice book club, um, it meets about monthly, and so that's something that you can do remote, which has been really nice, and then um, within each bureau and each division, there are conversations happening, so I'm in the Public Protection and Advocacy Bureau, and we've created, after George Floyd's murder, we created a racial justice um, working group. And so we meet 
um, the goal of that is not solely to focus on how is our work racial, like racially justice uh, focused, but also, you know, how, like, let's think about this. Like, we're not just lawyers, we're not just worker bees, we're not just administrative staff, we're human beings existing in the world. And so um, we usually have, you know, a prompt, an article, or a mini documentary series that we watch and then discuss as a group, which is really nice because when you're living your life every day and you know, you leave your office, which might be your dining room, and you go into the world, the same issues that, you know, you're, you're seeing in your work, and you're seeing on the news exist in your life. And so um, having that kind of approach makes it so that you don't have to separate because you can't who you are as a person from the work you're doing, you can have those conversations with your peers, which I had an experience in other workplaces, really. Um, and then after um, specifically after George Floyd's murder, we had a uh, office wide conversation. So um, they're called open and honest conversations that our a number of staff in our office led. Um, and so those were like, you know, every we have 600 people in our office, everybody was welcome it was a WebEx, people participated. So that's really nice. And I think hard to do with that many people. Um, but they and we had I think about 350 to 400 people on those. So that's a lot. That's a pretty high uh, number for, for such a big office. Just looking at my notes to make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, but that's those are like the ways that we focus internally um, on kind of making an inclusive environment. Thank you, Amanda. Those are some really great initiatives that allow attorneys to bring their authentic selves to the workplace, um, which I know is something that many students worry about when going into the workforce. Um, and so as you and Tracy mentioned, inclusion and diversity is important to all of the organizations hiring legal talent. So I want to pose this next question to all of you as it relates to the 1L recruitment. Can you talk to the platforms that your respective organization uses to recruit 1L diverse applicants? Ms. Kim, if you don't mind, can we start with you? Um, you can call me Helen as well. Um, so I uh, was a recipient of Goodwin's 1L Diversity um, Fellowship, which is a way that Goodwin, I think, um, kind of reaches out and wants to recruit underrepresented uh, people within the legal field. Um, and the way they do it is, I think they choose around 10 1L fellows who um, are given like a $10,000 scholarship for um, being part of a, to do a 1L uh, internship in a summer, a public interest oriented. So you're not working with Goodwin your 1L summer, but they're kind of sponsoring your 1L summer. Um, and then that also gives you an opportunity to um, do a, callback basically you're guaranteed a callback with them um and they're basically just uh i want to say like flagging people that they definitely want to interview and give an opportunity um to, to then come in as a 2l associate so that's how i came in with goodwin i did the fellowship and then um was given a callback at the choice of the office that you want um and then it's just kind of like a path and i know it's hard for for me, it was like my 1L summer, do I, you're kind of torn, do I have to take a job um, that pays me money versus um, kind of doing something public interest that interests you? And I think Goodwin's um, scholarship really helped me decide what, like something I wanted to do while also giving me the opportunity to pay my expenses for the summer, so. Does that the question? I forget if there was more that you asked. Yes, no, that was a very good answer. Um, if any of the other panelists have um, things that they want to add. Who's going to, okay. okay. Uh, yes, so Wilmer Hale does have, we recruit 1L um, in Boston through the BLG. And for my, we also have an LCLD scholarship um, for a 1L student out of our DC office. And we are recently, um, starting to collaborate with some of our tech uh, clients. And there is a new initiative that, um, so you'll see with Google and Uber and um, Dropbox and um, Intel, uh, a number of organizations that uh, it's more of a split summer, not really a full split, um, 
but oh actually I take that back that's for second year students I don't think that's a first year students um so 1L we don't have as, as we don't put actually a lot of resources into the 1L summer aspect um at the firm uh, but we do have a few opportunities Thank you so much, Tracy. Um, Mr. Chang, this next question is for you. As, summer, as someone who reviews 1L applicants, what qualities or experiences do you look for in a candidate's application packet, specifically their resume and diversity statements when you're deciding whether to interview them? So uh, first, please call me Ed. <clears throat> I think we're all on a first name basis here. Uh, so what I look for are the same things that I think most people look for, which is uh, what law school and um, uh, whether or not you're, um, well, let me back up. <clears throat> so as a threshold matter, I, I interviewed and hired people for Sharon and Lodgen for 13 years. I recently rolled off. So now my partner, Chris Blazajewski, um, is the new hiring partner. And uh, we do hire first years. In fact, we usually hire first years for a number of reasons. And um, all you have to do is shoot an email to Chris and his email is C-R-B-L-A-Z-E-J-E-W-S-K-I at Sharon.com. Or you can just look him up at our website and uh, if, if you didn't catch the spelling. So um, going back to what I have looked at for the last 13 years, obviously first the law school, and then I look for any other um, uh, little bit undergraduate, uh, GPA. Uh, if there's a recommendation or reference from one of your favorite professors, that's really very helpful, if, especially if I know them. And I certainly also look at um, the uh, cultural or ethnic background. Um, so that's, you know, I've hired a lot of um, minority associates over the years. Um, in fact, I would say more often than not, uh, I'd say well over 50, I mean, more often than not, we have had minority associates at our summer associates than we have when, than, than, uh, than uh, otherwise. Um, I don't look for a diversity statement per se, uh, but I, I do find helpful, you know, obviously some sort of a sense of, uh, so if you have an Asian background, then that's sort of obvious. Um, but if you're not Asian, um, you know, some sort of a mention, let's say if you're uh, with one of the student groups, or if you do something that is oriented to an ethnic background, that's also helpful to mention, whether it's in your cover letter or in your resume, so that, um, so that I see that. Uh, we're interested in diversity, um, and the reason is also partly selfish, which is especially in litigation, <clears throat> it's easy, you know, if you have a whole room of uh, attorneys who are all some, from the same background, um, you have blind spots, and that's just not effective um, uh, advocacy. If you have a diversity, you know, men, women, older, younger, uh, different ethnic backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, different social economic backgrounds, then you have, um, you can spot issues, you can spot approaches that, you know, a room full of all the same people just won't be able to do as well, so. Thank you so much, Ed. Um, Amanda, if possible, can you talk to what qualities the AG's office looks at um, in terms of the resume or diversity statements when you're deciding to interview them? Sure. So when it comes and in our, do you mean specifically for one L's or yes, for, yeah, for or, one L's. or for all, whichever works. Okay. Yeah. So for one L's, um, you know, we understand that, you know, you're not going to have the same breadth of experience as a two L, you know, someone applying for their two L summer has. And so what we're looking at is, you know, trying to understand from your resume, a commitment to serve the public. So that could be things, you know, and it, it very well may be your 1L when you're applying for your 1L summer, things that you did before, either in college or if you worked in between college and law school. So community service, civic engagement work, um, things that were public facing. Uh, there's less of an opportunity to do clinics, um, 
to kind of do that work that you roll up your sleeves. And so we're looking more at that point one L summer for research and writing um, skills because the majority of the work that our interns do both their one L and two L summer is a lot of research and writing. I think there's some opportunities your 2L summer, depending on where you are in the office, to go to court um, under, you know, under SJC 303. But it really is a research and writing internship. So that's what we're looking for. Um, for your 2L summer, same thing. You know, what have you done over the course of law school and before that demonstrates a commitment to serve the public? Um, that 2L summer, if you did, if you chose to do a private um, sector internship, your 1L summer, that doesn't, we don't count that against you. I think obviously if you do a public interest uh, 1L summer internship, yeah, that is gonna help, but we don't we don't hold it against you people. It's a lot of good reasons to, you know, because you're interested, because you need, you know, the financial assistance, you wanna try it out, whatever it is. Um, so we don't, we don't hold that against you. Um, in terms of what we're looking for in diversity statements and cover letters, so, a cover letter is not a diversity statement and vice versa. So a common mistake we see people make is make is if they have to submit a cover letter and a diversity statement is they're redundant. And so your cover letter is really where you're talking about the skills you have and the concrete things that you know would make you good for this job and why we would benefit from having you. And then your diversity statement is where you talk about who you are as a person and why you're interested and what your background is. Um, you know, share as much as you feel comfortable sharing. Um, and I would say, don't share for the sake of sharing. If you can make a connection, you know, a narrative arc to, you know, this is my story. This is why I came to law school. So I want to be a lawyer. This is how it connects to the work that the AG's office does. That's compelling. Um, and so it also helps if you know what our office does, um, which, you know, I wouldn't blame you if you don't. Some people think we're the DA's office. So do your research. Um, talk to your um, career service office and see, are there alumni who work at the AG's office? There are. So talk to them. You know, that's an easy connection to make is just to talk to an alum and get a little bit off the page of what our office does. And, um, and hopefully that translates in your application as well. Thank you, Ms. Amanda. Um, I know that a lot of 1L um, mentees had asked me if there was a difference between a diversity statement and a cover letter. And thank you for clarifying that. Um, Helen, this is a two-part question uh, for you. In your experience as a law student applying to Goodwin's 1L Fellowship Program, uh, how did you structure your diversity statement and determine what to include and what not to include? And the second question is, how did you organize your time when you were applying to these types of positions with your school studies? Yeah, um, so actually going off of what Amanda said, um, some places will only require like some places require both a cover letter and a diversity statement. Others will only require one. Um, and they maybe sometimes frame it as like a personal statement only. So in those cases, and I think Goodwin was one of those when I was applying, um, I actually kind of incorporated some of my cover letter into my diversity statement because um, when I think of like diversity, it's not always just about race, at least for me. Like, it could be that I'm a first generation um, law student, a first generation college student. It could be the fact that um, you're like a parent, a working parent versus a traditional student who goes straight to, uh, to law school. It could also be um, like I've worked for six years before going to law school. And to me, that was kind of, you know, it made me different and, and it helped with my perspective, like Ed said. Um, all of these different little things, I think, are like an asset that bring a different perspective. Um, some of the community service stuff that I did, like those are things that, like Amanda said, you wanna create a story for yourself. So I was trying to incorporate all of that into my statement. Um, and when sometimes when you don't have a cover letter to put that into, like I wanted to put also the skills that I thought those things taught me. Um, so, I mean, I think it depends for each person, but you want to put in as much as you can to show who you are because the resume is like a list of accomplishments but it doesn't show your thought process of like why you've decided to take certain positions or kind of your life trajectory and i think your personal statement diversity statement cover letter is a way to kind of make it digestible for people and help them to understand you um as for timing i think 
try to do things early. So I know I went to like every CSO boot camp um, that Dorothy and CSO put on. They give you a really good timeline of when you need to start working on your resume, your cover letter. Um, and once you go to that boot camp, I think I pretty much worked on my cover letter and uh, resume the time after, right after the boot camp. And that's early on. So you want to have that all prepared beforehand because by the time you actually do have to apply, that's kind of hitting up on final schedule. And there's just too much going on. You don't want to have to like have to prioritize those. So if you have that set in the beginning, um, most of the time when you're applying, it's minor tweaks that you are doing as you research the places that you're going to apply to. But your meat of the a resume and cover letter is already set. So then it's much easier to apply. Um, and at that point, I think, I don't know if it's gonna, you're gonna ask later on, but I think I applied to around 25 or so, um, when all things. And I, I did it early because I was going to Cal, I knew I wanted to be in California and they have a different schedule out here. So always make sure that you um, are looking early and making sure um, no deadlines are passing. Um, but having that all prepared before like finals started, it will help me a lot. Um, so I would definitely suggest you guys do that as well. And I just wanna add, as we're getting close to finals, for those that have not focused on this yet, not to stress and worry about that. I mean it, I'm very, very serious. Um, the time frame, I think still for most of the 1L diversity scholarships. Um, applications are usually due in January. And excuse me. So if you had to decide, and I remember I would tell the students, I would tell you guys this all the time, a 1L diverse scholarship opportunity is phenomenal. I'm not knocking it, but it, it is not the end all and be all. It is not going to make or break you. You could have the most uh, competitive, uh, phenomenal once in a lifetime experience. But if at the end of the day, your grades are impacted and they're just not hitting certain expectations, you will not even be in the mix for receiving an interview, much less an offer. And so you're going to have to think and choose. And this is actually the summer where, you know, again, you've heard these positions are limited and few across the country. Um, Employers not expecting for you to have these type of positions only when you're applying, whether it's public or private, but they do want to hear what you're doing. So you do in that cover letter or, you know, in your second year with the OCI interviewing, you know, working for a law professor is a great experience. Clerking for a judge is a great experience. Um, even if it's something that's non-legally related, but you knew that it was a guarantee of a particular type of income, then it's important to explain that as well. Um, but a lot is unfortunately still going to um, relate on where your grades are. And, and that's just the hardcore reality, which is why first year is as challenging as it is because in many ways, that's that's just the baseline of where you're going to start from. Thank you, Tracy. Um, that is great advice. Um, and I love how you're not sugarcoating it. Grades are important. Oh, no. <laughs> I can't because, again, you know, I mean, it's not the end of the world. And it's not as if you can't regain, but it's just putting yourself in a, in a different posture than with having to overcompensate for what happened. And especially, I guess my biggest frustration and concern has always historically been with the students. If it's because you just um, chose to focus on something that was not academic related and that had an impact on your, um, your assessments. Uh, because at the end of the day that, again, I'm not saying that I agree with this, but the the model out there is that's going to be at least the beginning and the way that they start to sift through the mountains of um, applications that come through. 
Um, so I guess stemming from that comment, I was wondering if you can also speak on the importance of attending virtual firm receptions to be considered um, as an applicant. And um, after you, I, I'm hoping that Ed, I'll love your opinion on this as well. Sure. Um, I don't, you know, it's really different now, right? And we're all trying to figure this out. And I've had an opportunity to assist and sit in on a few. Um, the one thing I will tell you though, is regardless of how you connect with a particular firm, nine out of 10 times, if not 9.9 .9 or 10 out of 10, they are keeping track of the fact that there was a connection, whether your name showed up on an RSVP list. So if this was pre-COVID or hopefully post-COVID times and you RSVP to attend an event and you don't show up, um, a lot of times students will like, oh, it's not a big deal. What's the big deal? Well, it would show that you RSVP'd and they will know at the end of the night that you didn't come. Now, I'm not saying that something doesn't happen that could get in the way, but to take, especially in the beginning when you're trying to um, make a first impression and, and build this network, it doesn't hurt you to either shoot an email really quickly to the recruiting um, manager or coordinator um, along the line of apologizing if something came up and why you weren't able to make the event. At this day and age, the virtual networking events that we've had, they've been interesting. Um, I, I, they will not hold against you at all if you don't participate, but whether you're planning to attend and participate or not, before you start interviewing, before you actually start sending in those cover letters, you need to do that research about those firms. Um, there are still, not a lot, but there is still every year, you have folks that send a cover letter and say, I'd really like to, I'm, I'm very interested in working for Wilmer, but they're applying to Goodwin. Um, you really need to make sure that it doesn't appear to be just a, a just random kind of cookie cutter letter. I mean, for the most part, yes. But do your research, ladies and gentlemen, because you need to understand what kind of practice groups different firms specialize in. And you don't wanna be that person that says, oh, I really wanna focus on bankruptcy to find out the firm doesn't have a bankruptcy department. You should know that beforehand. And that does get held against you because it gives off the sense of, um, lack of engagement at best, laziness at worst. And, and I really don't want any of you to ever be misperceived in that way. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else to talk along that line. Um, but yeah, so attending these virtual events, jury's still out about that. You know, it's an opportunity to meet usually with some of the more junior associates um, and get a sense perhaps of their personalities or culture. And usually you're not gonna have the really big heavy hitters that are gonna be on those calls sometimes, but they're not in a position to make a decision then. They're still gonna wait to see your full package. Ed, on to you. Lane, repeat the question again. <laughs> so the question was, um, I was wondering if you can speak on to the importance of attending virtual firm receptions to be considered as an applicant? Well, I mean, so because I'm at a, at a mid-sized firm, uh, I think I can speak for generally mid-sized and small firms. We don't really have uh, virtual receptions. We just don't do receptions. Our hiring process is pretty straightforward. You send a cover letter and resume to the hiring partner and they, they sift through it and then they um, interview a number of people. So I would typically interview maybe five to seven uh, people and then pick, pick a couple. Um, so in that respect, um, I can't answer that question from my perspective as the hiring partner at Sharon and Lodgen. I do wanna echo something that Tracy just said, which is, um, you know, we're in weird times. Well, let me, even in normal times, um, I did also hire second year uh, law students and I didn't really care what they did during their first year summer. Um, you know, if you've, if you, uh, 
if you have a good GPA and you make the cut to be interviewed, then I'm looking for things like personality. You know, is this a person I would like to have in the office? You know, if, if um, and then the other thing I'm looking for is, um, you know, is, does this person look like they're conscientious and hardworking um, and, and will really do a good job for us? So um, when you add the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic, then, you know, whether you have a good first year job really doesn't make a big difference for second year hiring. So please don't freak out about it. Now, you know, obviously if you get, you know, a, a first year uh, summer job at one of the big firms and you hit it out of the ballpark and they love you, you love them, that, you know, that's great. But, you know, generally speaking, nine out of 10 people or, you know, the vast majority of people who are hired as second years at big firms aren't going to be, it's not going to be make or break in terms of what they did their first year. So please don't sweat that. Um, I think the last piece I would say is this, which is, um, <laughs> so when I interviewed, this is a while ago, uh, when I interviewed at, this is probably my most embarrassing interview story. I said, well, I really want to work here at Foley Hogue. I think Foley Hogue is an awesome firm. And so the partner at the interview said, well, we have Foley Hoag. I was like, oh my God, I guess I should have figured out the name of the firm. Um, anyway. That's also a Boston thing, though, I think sometimes, you know. <laughs> like, yeah, really, right? I always like, throw it to the Boston accent, you know. <laughs> Holy hoag. I was like, oh my God, I'm never going to get a second round ever. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, doing a little bit of research, uh, uh, learning how to pronounce the name of the firm are, are, is, is helpful. Uh, you know, all kidding aside, you do want to know a little bit about the firm. Um, you know, Tracy's comment about, hey, I can't wait to join your bankruptcy practice and there is none, is not looked upon, you know, very favorably. Um, so that's, I think that's all I have to add. Um, if I could just chime in about getting information about the firm. I know when I was applying, it's really hard when you look at their websites, they say they're kind of proficient in everything, but you don't really know like the specialties. So that's where it's good where if you can reach out to someone who works at the firm, they have a much better understanding about what the firm really cares about, their big markets. So that is something you wanna ask. Um, if you can get like a, just like a Zoom meeting um, and talk about the firm, you wanna see it from someone who's working in, in the firm, like their perspective. Um, and that will give you a lot more information than if you're just trying to browse their website. Um, I know a lot of the vaults and I think there's another- MCA, um, MCCA. Yeah, so those type of websites will also give you a little more insight about the firm. So it's not just the generic website that you're trying to figure out. But to, to piggyback off of what Helen said, I will tell you guys hands down, BC has some of the most phenomenal alumni I have ever encountered in my career. Um, and you can literally look up an organization. I would, I would suggest that you perhaps look for associates perhaps versus going straight to a partner just because of the time constraint and what's involved. But to make a cold call or send an email and say, hi, you know, I'm Tracy and I'm a first year at BC Law School and I see that you practice here, blah, blah, blah. Was wondering if you had just had a few minutes uh, to chat about your experiences there or, you know, this or that, you will probably get a response. Um, and, and, and that I had always found was very unique and specifically special to Boston College Law School. So um, I think that the students, the lawyers remember what it was like when they were students and they do believe in paying it back and um, it's paying it forward, right? Yeah, <laughs> but uh, that's, um, that's something which you should be um, aware of and, take advantage of and also be mindful of and remembering that when you're in those positions to also answer the call. Yeah, Tracy, I think that's an excellent point. Networking is so important in BC law. Um, people do look out for each other. I mean, Boston is ultimately a small town and I have found that there's a lot of um, loyalty to, to uh, BC law from BC law grads. Um, and also, since we're speaking to um, um, 
uh, students of color, talk to people in the various uh, bar organizations. So the Asian American Lawyers uh, Association of Massachusetts, ALAM, we love talking to students. We love bringing people into the fold. We love helping um, other Asian American um, uh, lawyers. Um, there aren't a lot of us in Boston. And so, you know, we got to take care of our own. And I, you know, I know for a fact the other organizations uh, also have a similar um, viewpoint. And let me be absolutely clear about this. Um, you're not taking advantage or you're not taking an unfair advantage of the situation when you contact Alan, because some of your classmates will have, you know, uh, been members of, let's say, a yacht club or, you know, a, a tennis club or a tennis and racket club and been hobnobbing with some other people that, you know, you may not have had, had access to their whole lives and they take it for granted. Um, everybody uses whatever context they have and advantages that they have, you know, based on their upbringing and, and where they grew up and who they grow up with. Um, the fact that you're, you know, whether you're black, Asian American, Hispanic, Latino, you know, fine and take advantage of it. There, there are groups out there of other lawyers similarly situated, talk to them and they will help you. And it's, and it's perfectly good and you should do that. There is an affinity bar association for every affinity group nationwide, not just in Boston. And I just want to emphasize, I know a lot of you on this call might not actually be considering staying in Boston. We would love you to stay, don't get me wrong. But nationwide, whatever city you're from, I strongly advise you to, um, to reach out as well. Um, and the other thing is the Boston Bar Association, as a law student, you have a free membership to join that. And I'm actually the co-chair um, of their diversity, equity, and inclusion um, committee. And there are a lot of initiatives that the BBA is actually, especially now with everything going on with COVID and remote learning, putting resources together to help law students, um, again, throughout the job search, um, success in law school, networking, et cetera. So um, it does take a little bit of time, but you're gonna to have to step up because nobody's gonna come and knock on your door just because you're you. Can I add in on that? So two things on the researching, like researching and networking and um, to Ed's point about like not feeling bad about doing that. I think, you know, one way to think about it is when you're reaching out to somebody who, you know, an infinity bar or someone who shares a similar background to you, you know, it's not just, you're not just trying to use a connection. You're also trying to understand, you know, if I, I'm Latina, I want to know what this, this Latina woman's experience at this office, right? You want to get an experience and it's helpful to talk to somebody else, but they might not have the answer you're looking for, might not share, you know, a characteristic that is what you're specifically trying to control for. So that's one thing. The other thing I would advise, and I, to Tracy's point, huge, <laughs> huge encouragement to do this when you're in law school. I didn't. I was, I didn't like law school. I love being a lawyer. I could have cared less about being in law school. Um, I was, I like my clinical work and I like my internships and now I like practicing. So don't feel bad if that's how you feel, but I wish I had. And when I clerked, my judge had encouraged me to join the BBA, reach out to people. And most importantly, talk to people when you're not looking for a job and you're not looking for an internship, right? So you lock down your summer internship, still keep talking to people because sometimes those conversations are actually a little more natural because you're not looking for like can you help me get a job you're just you're, it's a listening tour you're trying to learn about what that person's experience is like at this office at that office especially if you're not sure what kind of law you want to go into it you can't you can't try everything you only have two internships you only have so many clinics um so I am a huge proponent of talk to people and use your alumni network. When you talk to somebody, ask them, do you know anybody who else I could speak with? You know, maybe it's in the same field, maybe it's in a different field um, and kind of use that as a snowball effect. But it's, it's, you know, you might later, you might apply to that office and you've already established a connection and then you can circle back. And so, especially in the world where you don't have those in-person networking events, using the virtual world where it's easier for people to pick up the phone and do a 30 minute call versus meeting you for coffee. Those kinds of quick calls are a lot easier now, actually. Um, you can be in your pajamas, so, um, so take advantage Just of that. Just be prepared to have a conversation, all exactly. right? Nothing more painful 
than being on the other side of the phone and someone who wants to speak to you about your firm or your organization and you say, hi, hi, and then they just, there's pause. You guys have to have relevant conversations and, you know, in addition to introducing yourself, tie it in with the why, the why I'm calling you. Now, are there questions from the participants, Dorothy? The, the no, there are no questions yet, but I um, love what everybody has been sharing. I was just coming on to um, say a few things that relate to what everybody has just been saying. One, I loved Ed's story about um, Foley Hogue, which so many students oh. do. But um, well, well, I was laughing. One second. I was thinking better it was there versus saying, oh, you're at Foley Lartner. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Um, <laughs> um, I was like afraid you were going to. <laughs> yeah, right. But we have, and I'm sure that's happened, but we yeah. have created a um, law firm pronunciation guide that's on our Google Drive. I just wanted to let students know about that. And it, it actually says the name of the law firm. <laughs> and we pretty, we have a lot of law firms there. It hasn't been updated in a while. So there may be some that aren't on there that are now in Boston. Um, I also wanted to say, I loved what everybody said and getting back to sort of the original question about whether or not it's good, it's a good idea and how important it is to attend law firm receptions. I was going to say that it, what's more important is to connect with these firms, which is what all of you are talking about in the various ways that you can do that with, especially through BC alums. Um, so if, if, if you, are completely uncomfortable attending a reception or you can't attend a reception, what is important to do is to connect with people who are at the firms that you're interested in doing and using all the ways that everybody just said that were so important and so great. And BC Special Sauce is the strong alumni network and people do respond and they're so helpful. So I just wanted to say that. <laughs> That's it, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Dorothy. Um, I want to circle back to something that Ed said earlier about references, which is also another piece of networking that students tend to disregard. Um, Amanda, can you speak on if references are required to apply to the AG's office? Yes, I will. And I will actually double check our intern for the internship. Um, I don't think that there is a, a references requirement for other parts of the office there are. So um, specifically for the fellowship. So I entered the AG's office through our fellowship program. Um, so to an earlier question of how we try to recruit, that's one of one of our initiatives that came out of our DNI um, program is our as our um, fellowship. And so for the fellowship, and that's how a way for recent grads or grads coming straight out of a clerkship. Um, to enter the AG's office. So you do need references there and it's just kind of like an online form. I didn't do the internship, so I don't, the, the, our online portal doesn't say you need a reference, um, but I think it always helps. And this is like, again, to that point of like talking to people, if you're getting ready to apply to something, an internship, and you don't know, you know, you might have a couple of applications that you know need references, but you might apply to others. And so you don't know. I think it's always helpful to identify, you know, two to three people that you think can be references and let them know. I'm not sure if I'm going to end up reaching out because I don't know if I need a reference yet. But if I if I do, would you be willing to be a reference and doing that, you know, mm -hmm. to earlier so that someone knows. And so you're not like calling, you know, that has happened to me and you know, I send an email at 11 p.m. and be like, hi, no, it's late. I'm listening to you as a reference. Hope that's OK, because this is due in an hour, like not ideal. Um, sometimes it can't be avoided. We're only human, but to the extent, you know, lesson learned from that is that now I, you know, if I, if I needed references, I would ask them ahead of time. And so I don't need a reference now, but you know, that, so that would, that would be my, my word of advice is think about that. Um, and in terms of references to take, I don't, you know, I think at least for the AG's office, it's not about the, who's like the highest uh, ranked person that can, you can list as a reference. It's if you're making a calculus, it's better to think about who actually knows me, who supervised my work. Um, you know, if and, and if you want to do a mixture of somebody, you know, maybe a professor and a, someone who's not a professor, but is has supervised your work, you know, just think about diversifying your list of references. Um, 
And one way to do that is I, I, maybe you worked for a, a professor, but you actually interfaced more with somebody below them on their team. Talk to them and say, I want to list this professor. Can I, would you be comfortable, you know, telling them what the work I did for you? And you can do that in an internship, like you're one all summer, you know, um, have the person who was maybe a line, in my case, a line AG, um, who su closely watched your work, say, I want to list the division chief. You know, if, if I did, could you speak to them and tell them what I did? Yeah, but on the flip side, you can list that person, but if that person hasn't actually worked with you or supervised you, I know they're less, they're more hesitant perhaps about how much they're going to sign off on this. Um, to the 1L law students, as I used to always tell you guys, and I can't stress enough, you have to go to office hours and meet your professors. You need to develop relationships and network with your faculty um, because especially in the beginning, they're going to look for faculty recommendations. And please, please, please don't think that you can pop a few days beforehand this request to please write my recommendation for me because it's frustrating. Um, it's not a guarantee they're going to be able to do it. And you know what we used to actually tell the students was especially along certain courses. So with legal research and writing, that's a really important class. And if you're able, and it's also a smaller class, so you should have opportunities to get to know those professors better. And they're also able to provide more insight into some of your abilities other than the one exam that you take or how often you speak in class. Um, and just also remember that as you then progress throughout your career, you are always going to have a need for references and background checks. And to make sure that you are not that person that everyone is really happy leaves when you leave and try to go somewhere else, because I don't know how you're gonna be able to do that when they're gonna want some kind of reference or referral from people that you're working with or at a prior uh, um, organization. So relationships matter. They started it as soon as you matriculated at this law school. You think this is just college and no, 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 it's not. Because 10 years from now, that person who you want business from might be sitting in that assistant GC's role or in that position to do so. And you don't have to be the best of friends, but you know, don't be the person that folks love to hate. That's all I can say for that. I just to add, I think when I was clerking the they like sat us down on the first day and were like all you have is your reputation That's and right. so and a lot of the judges when they apply to be judges they ask them you know list opposing counsel that we can speak to so Absolutely. it's not you know so I think Tracy's 100% right is you don't have to be everybody's best friend but you shouldn't be the person everyone's like oh my goodness they um, I've had classmates reach out to me wanting to apply to the office and I'm like, oh, interesting that, you know, you know, and some you people to exactly. to. so just think about that. You just want to be a good person. Yeah. If I can just jump in. So I was on the uh, judicial nominating committee. I forgot commission. So we reviewed the uh, applications for attorneys to become judges. And uh, as part of our due diligence, we literally called opposing counsel in the applicants cases. And, <clears throat> and you know, there were some who would say, oh, uh, counsel had sharp, sharp elbows. And you, you hear that, you're like, eh. Uh, but in the biggest, I, you know, I would say the biggest compliment is uh, when we had an ADA and defense counsel said, this person was really tough, but I always knew they turned over all the evidence that they had to, and they were always fair. And you know, when we heard that, we said, okay, this person can be a judge because defense counsels are saying this person's fair, right? Um, I, when I, I started at a firm called Hill and Barlow um, many, many years ago. And um, when the firm exploded, opposing counsel in one case called me the next day and asked if I would jump over there. And that's, be, you know, we crushed them all the way you know, on the superior, in the land court and on appeals and, but we were always very polite about it. Uh, we always extended professional courtesies um, and we treated them as colleagues of the bar, um, but just were on different sides of the, of the issue and that was it. And so, you know, I had very nice feelings uh, about 
the them as counsel and they obviously reciprocated and so that led to an offer which was um uh, very comforting at that particular time which is a way of saying be nice to your classmates be nice to opposing counsel that's right please <laughs> Thank you all. Um, I know we are running a uh, short of time. So I was wondering if you all could provide approaches um, for students on how to approach a professor for a reference, especially during uh, the time of COVID when they haven't had an opportunity to really get to know them. I, you know, the, I assume they have office hours, even if it's uh, by telephone or Zoom. And if they don't, um, just email professor and um, get to know them. I, I got to know several of my professors uh, reasonably well. Uh, in fact, I keep in touch with a couple of them and I graduated in 96. Um, and, you know, if one of them ever sent a resume to me, uh, th that's guaranteed an interview. I mean, you know, Professor Builder or Professor Broden sent me a student uh, that they liked. Uh, I'm going to interview them. You know, if nothing else, out of professional courtesy, because I, I adore them, uh, the professors that is. So um, the way I got to know them is I went into their during their office hours, and um, you know, if ever I had a question about something in class, you know, I'd ask them. We talk about mm -hmm. it, and I would learn from them. Uh, there's no reason not to do that. They like to get to know the students too. Uh, it's not as hard and daunting as it would seem to be. Um, so I really encourage you to get to know your professors. Quick question, Elaine. So that's right. It just dawned on me now. They're not in session. I thought BC was back in person. Yes or no, but they're not doing off. They're not holding office hours. It's a hybrid system currently. Okay. So I think the smaller classes are meeting in person. Um, okay. But then the larger doctrinal classes um, are, are online. online. Correct. So again, that being said, it would be with, I would hope that they would have um, some kind of office, virtual office hours or chats that you show up and attend. And that's again, a way for you to interact and engage with your professors. And right now that's the best that you have. Um, but I think everyone is going to be cognizant and I'm sure that any professor that has to write anything for you will premise it by saying, you know, in light of or in spite of these constraints, here's someone who I was able to get to know as best as possible considering circumstances and where we are and what's going on and blah, 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 blah. But yes, that's, that's what I would strongly advise. And thank you. Um, I think we have one question from a student in the Q&A section. Um, so it says, can the panelists name some of the BC law professors whose recommendation would be especially helpful? A professor that knows you the best. <laughs> I mean, I know that that's, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck with that, but you know, you just heard Ed say Professor Bilden or Broden. And if you don't have them as faculty members, it's going to be very, very difficult to try to forge a relationship with them such that they're able to actually talk about your, your work performance, right? Interactions with you in the classroom setting. Um, so that being said, get to know, it, it's the professors who you know the best that are actually able to talk about your your talent and your skills and um, what you bring to the table. Yeah, I mean, the thing I'm looking for are is, is someone who's um, obviously smart, hardworking, um, you know, takes responsibility for work. So the person who has worked with you is is going to be able to tell me that, right? So, so if, if, you, if you just look for a big name who says, well, you know, I worked with this student through, uh, and, and this student did a few things for me, um, and we worked primarily through other interfaces, then that's not very helpful, okay? Mm -hmm. But if it's another professor, I don't know particularly well, but this professor said, this student worked with me all through the semester, uh, worked very closely with me on one of the articles I wrote, 
Um, she not only helped me with the research, she came up with a couple ideas and followed up even on things that I hadn't asked her about and um, got everything done on time. And I just, I just loved working with her. Then I'm, th I'm getting all excited. I'm like, oh my God, she, she thought of these ideas that I hadn't asked her. She did her work on time. She was thorough. You know, I can't wait to hire this person, right? And, and this is because this professor is talking about the student from deep firsthand experience. That's why that matters more than, you know, does this particular professor publish on Harvard Law Review in the last six months? I don't care. What I do care is, does this professor vouch for certain qualities that the student has that I want in my office? Perfect. And I'm going to say goodbye to everyone. I'm so sorry. I do have to hop off because I have a one o'clock meeting that started a minute ago. Um, but it was really, really a pleasure to see everyone here on the panel and good luck to everyone that is attending or that will be listening to this. So, bye. Thank you. Thank you. I actually have to hop off as well, but thank you for inviting me and I hope good luck to everyone on everything. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Thank you. Bye. Um, lastly, before if if um, Amanda and Ed has time for this. Lastly, before we let everybody go, I was wondering if you could um, briefly give a tip to the one else attending this um, panel today, uh, just general advice. I can, I can start while I, if you want, I, is that okay? Uh, my general advice is actually, it relates to a chat, a question we got in the chat. Um, saying how do you express your interest to attorneys if you're unsure precisely which practice areas you're interested in. And it ties to what I was saying earlier about kind of embarking on a listening tour, even when you're not looking, you know, you're not like submitting an application and looking for a specific thing. I'd say, to, I'd say the first part is do some soul searching, right? Sit down and think about which classes, you know, am I interested in, which are hard, but I still find like, you know, intellectually stimulating. What, um, why did I come to law school? You know, what, what's the things that are motivating me? And you might, you, I would say like, you probably shouldn't know, you know, on day one of, of law school, I want to do X kind of thing because you want to be open to how law school can change you. Um, but I'd say identify a few areas. Like I'm interested in, I don't know, um, public defense work, or I'm interested in family law or whatever it is and, and start there. Right. And I think focus on two things, focus on issue area and work setting, right? Because you can work on family law as an example, you can work on, or I guess, immigration law. You can work on that from so many different angles, right? As an immigration attorney, as an impact, as an impact litigation lawyer at the ACLU, as um, someone who's doing pro bono work at a law firm. So there's so many different ways to work on a specific area. So figuring out both like, what kind of issues do I wanna work on? And then what kind of work setting do I wanna do that in? Criminal, you know, civil, public, private, um, impact, client work. And so I would say you don't have to know the answers to all those questions, but thinking about it in those two buckets and then having those conversations to help you, you know, figure out the boundaries of what you're interested in. I, I guess my tip would be this. Um, you belong at the law school where you are. Um, you know, you earned your way there. Um, work hard, get good grades, you know, and, and get, a good, get a job and wherever you are, uh, just be aware that you earned it and you deserve to be there. Don't ever feel like, um, don't ever feel like you're a second class citizen because you're not. Um, that being said, you know, do the best you can, uh, be thorough, be careful. Uh, those are things within your own um, uh, grasp. Those are things that you can bring to the table, but definitely don't ever let anybody make you feel like a second class citizen. Um, I can't emphasize enough, you deserve to be where you are now. You deserve to be lawyers, you know, wherever you want to practice. So you belong, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you to all the panelists for joining us today. It was a wonderful session. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Good luck, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.